Where AdFest is at the moment is there is such a latent capability within this festival. And by that I mean it's got a history, it's got a legacy, it's got supporters and I would say fanatics. And the great thing is I think once you're at AdFest you become an evangelist. And it's interesting that as a committee we got together and we're always looking how can we evolve AdFest? How can we make it better? How can we make it more relevant? How can we make it more culturally closer to the communities we want to uh, affect and serve? So we've got a, a lot of exciting things happening at the moment. And you know, as I say, it's always sharpening the saw, getting it more focused and trying to do less better and trying to have short-term achievable goals and achieve them. So we're really excited to be running an activation this year, a workshop called Shape My Portfolio. The idea is to nurture the next generation of creative talent and provide a really unique curated experience for young creatives or up and coming creatives to share their portfolio with some of the fantastic senior creatives we have on site at AdFest. The amazing speakers, the judges, members of the advisory board. We really want to give back and help provide this opportunity for them. And what better place to do it than at AdFest? Hi, my name is Fadi. I'm coming from Riyadh. Hi, I'm Lahini. I'm from Sri Lanka. Hello, my name is Akif. I'm from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I got to showcase my portfolio. I got to learn a lot from him. You need to showcase yourself as well, not just your work. So you need to put your personality on the website, on your portfolio. And this makes you more reachable to people. Of course, you need to have good work, but you need to showcase your personality as well. I always knew that AdFest was all about grooming the future talent. I was wondering what really matters in our career development. And the one thing that is extremely critical is to have a really good portfolio. Forget about certifications and everything else. I think the portfolio is the gateway to your future. You need to craft it well. And sometimes crafting means editing, making sure that the best thing comes up to the first page. Don't write long stories about yourself in the first page because sometimes the CCOs have no time. I've just seen a, a young creative. She's an example. She's an amazing artist, but her work's buried under tons of words that didn't reflect well for her. As I dug deeper and I saw that she was a brilliant, brilliant talent. We are hoping to make an impact for people like her, you know, to teach her how to curate her portfolio, make it the newspaper of yourself, right? Where are the headlines? And that's what your portfolio needs to be. If I'm interested and I'm excited by who you are, I'm more likely to find out more and, and get into the details of of you know the stories behind you. That first page is so critical. I think everyone should come to this ad fest because it's really insightful and there's so many creative works and then there's so many things to learn. Always keep it simple and show what you want to show them and then make them see what they want to see. He picked what has most potential, what defines me better and asked me to reposition it. Told me what highlights, what I should highlight and what I shouldn't highlight. And gave me pointers on how to rearrange my portfolio in a way that it really represents my potential and what I'm capable of doing. This is a two-way process and I know from having spoken with some of our very generous mentors, they're really enjoying this experience. It's a great opportunity for them to meet some fantastic talent and to see and really learn from kind of this next generation of the way they present the work and what's up and coming. It's a two-way experience. Everyone's really enjoying it so far and we hope to run this at many more events in the future. So my takeaway from this uh, session was you can always do better, you know? You can always push yourself forward and you're never done and you have to actually work with people in advertising, not work for an agency, you know? The working with the person that you work with, that's the most important thing in your career. I think it's important that we got a lot of perspectives from all the different CCOs, from different agencies, because to make this industry a thriving one, I think it's all of us coming together uh, to learn our experiences, and it's not just one perspective of it. It's really encouraging to see that 
different CCOs were all coming in, you know, from David to Paddy to Pete. They are, they are all coming in and leaning in to help our young talent in our industry. Um, putting aside our badges of being whatever agency we are in, like, but we're just here as humans wanting to help other young talents in our industry and keep this a thriving uh, community. So I'm really happy that this has happened. I think what struck me most about AFS was I've heard, I think, more accents and more languages spoken here than I've heard at any global festival or show. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that AdFest celebrates local cultures right across the Asia and Pacific region. They come together in one place and it's an incredible melting pot of all those different experiences, all those different cultures coming together in one. The work we've seen here I think is truly world class and it's world class in its own way because it's world class coming from these fantastic, really vibrant, really interesting cultures across Asia and the Pacific. In some cases, that means that the world-class work we're seeing might not succeed in a global show because the local context isn't understood. And that can often be what's making the work so powerful. Nonetheless, it is truly world-class. Big challenge globally this year for creativity is definitely around AI, as much as it's an opportunity. And I would say that of all technologies that have hit the industry, data and everything else that come along with the conversation, they provide so many exciting opportunities creativity-wise to do things we've never done before. And at the same time, I just feel that perhaps they're overshadowing the creative conversation as an industry. Yeah, we work really hard at fostering great creativity, no surprise. Really our creative philosophy of ideas that move has never been more relevant. And I think what it really inspires for our creative teams all around the world is to actually find new ways of looking at very sophisticated technologies and what we can do with them to ensure that we are using them in a way and creating things with them, which has a very human side to it. We're connecting brands with consumers. We're looking to move consumers. That philosophy of ideas that move is what's proving really powerful for us. In parallel to that, we have a super high cadence of, of creative leadership review cycles and development of work. And that enables us to move in a much more agile way than other creative networks. We, we don't do the traditional quarterly or half year sit back and review. We're very much in the process of moving forward the whole time. If you're thinking about creative you know, side of advertising, you'd be joining at the most exciting time there's ever been in the industry. For all the reasons we've discussed in terms of what we can do with new technologies, with AI on, you know, emerging in the way it is. But what I would really say, and just remember, this is a very human business. It really takes investment of getting to know your clients as people and spending enough time in life seeing how people are in the world. Because at the end of the day, you've really got to connect with people. Uh, so you can't do this job sitting behind a computer or on a phone all day, you need to be tapped into people. What we're trying to find in our new directors and our emerging directors is really a unique voice. At the end of the day, that's what separates good directors from great directors. I found the room to be a very respectful room. There was a variety of cultural representatives from different regions, which I thought really helped the process. There was also a multidisciplinary jury. So there was producers, directors, sound specialists, some music specialists. A lot of bases covered, I guess, from a cultural perspective and from a disciplinary perspective. Um, and I found that helped the discussions immensely. So it was good to get some cultural context on some of the work that, that I found really helped us work out what might resonate with the, you know, the, the intended audience. And then in terms of the work, I thought the work was a very high standard this year. And a lot of work from different regions, which uh, I really thought was interesting and heartening. And the high standard work is spread across the region rather than all coming from one, one particular market. Look, I mean, it's sort of in its infancy in how, how much we use it. To be honest, we don't tend to use it a hell of a lot in filmmaking process. A lot of it is 
We use AI as a tool in pitching, we use it as a tool in pre, so we often use it for treatments just to kind of get more specific images if it's, you know, if we're trying to demonstrate a particular scene that, that is hard to find reference for, we might use AI. We try to use it a little bit sparingly. At the end of the day, we still and will always see ourselves as a, uh, as a craft-led organisation. Like, I think that it's in the DNA of the company. So what we're trying to do is make sure that wherever we go, whatever the distribution method, that we still maintain a level of craft. That's evident in some of the work that we've seen this year from Finch, which was Modi Body was TikTok native format, but still really lovingly created. You know, it wasn't created, you know, it was created super fast from a commercial perspective, but it wasn't shot on an iPhone, it was shot on Alexa for 9x16 and still had a lot of craft in art department, casting, camera work. As we move forward and, and we're not intimidated in any way by the, the new formats that are coming out, but what we continually remind ourselves of is that we need to still maintain a high level of craft. What we're trying to find in our new directors and our emerging directors is really a unique voice. People with a unique point of view and a unique lens on the world and then surrounding them with the right technicians and the right expertise to lift their craft, help them achieve their visions. But the number one thing that we look for is a unique perspective. The stronger the conflict, the more interesting your story becomes. I've been asked, you know, Guan, how do you build your brand? Guan, how do you start an agency? I think before you do anything, you need to build your own brand. And I'm talking a personal brand. I mean, we are more than just a job title. Today, I'm a creative chairman. Tomorrow, I could be somebody else. How do you build a brand that you yourself can own? Which is understanding what your passions are, understanding what you're capable of doing. And the third thing is understanding what the world needs. So when I started uh, with this book called Collide, I wanted to find something that's evergreen. I wanted to find something that is tangible. But I need to brand it that people can say it in one word, which is Collide. And the words we use is very, very carefully chosen. Embracing conflict to boost creativity. You know, for all of us, we run away from conflict. We steer away from conflict. And especially as Asians, you know, we try and not have any confrontation. But embracing conflict is about us trying to create stories and tensions and finding enemies. Because without any conflict, it's going to be very boring. In every superhero movie, there's always an enemy. Without the enemy, the hero will not stand out. So the conflict that we're trying to create, not just the stories in the, the movie world or the advertising world, the stronger the conflict, the more interesting your story becomes. For me, personal branding is really important because people need to know how to search for you. When you lose your job, right, and we start, when you start to search, that's really too late. So by building your personal brand, you're able to offer value to your, you know, for your followers. And the more followers you have, the more likes you have, you need to engage them through the conversations. So once people know you, then they're able to approach you for many, many opportunities. So personal branding is a must in whatever level of title you happen to be working for in a company right now. So my first award was at the Art Centre College of Design. So I re did really badly in school and one of the things that I wanted to do was being a creative person. But in those days, you can imagine over 30 years ago, there wasn't much as an option, right? Whether you're a graphic designer or an advertising. So in school, um, I attended a graphic design course when the teacher said, if you want to make money, you got to be in advertising. So I enrolled in Art Centre College of Design in Pasadena. It was the best thing that happened to me. So obviously in that school, there's a lot of competition. Uh, there were not many Asians at that time. So understanding the American culture was quite difficult. I was struggling a lot. Towards the end of the semester, there was this competition called the Los Angeles Creative Club Student Competition. And that was something that everybody wanted to participate. So I put my book together thinking that, hey, maybe you know, if I can maybe just win a, a bronze would be great. 
So the evening went on and on and on and I see all my classmates going up collecting the awards. As I was walking out, they called my name and I turned around and it was the best of show. So that was an incredible moment to win the best of show starting out in my career. And that's how I got my first job in advertising at Crescent Craig. So Adfest has been a revelation for me because I think we've seen some fantastic work, both in terms of ideas and craft, and ideas that actually came from very local cultural insights. Design is not a solo game, it's a team game. And that's really why the name Elephant. It's like the story of blind people and elephant, where each one of them touches a part of the elephant and says, hey, I know what an elephant is. It's a wall, it's a rope, it's a tree trunk, and so on. And basically, elephant is all of those things. So we felt that each of us were, were holding a shiny piece of jigsaw puzzle. And if we put it together, we make the big picture of design in India. We are not looking for more designers. We say we are looking for more blind people. Basically, blind is just a metaphor, as you understand. People who know that there is much more to know and they don't know everything. And I think designers need to be that. They need to be this curious lot who wants to find out more, ask more questions, find out the unknown and so on, right? So Adfest has been a revelation for me because I think we've seen some fantastic work, both in terms of ideas and craft and ideas that actually came from very local cultural insights. And my, my interest always lies in, you know, how are you taking culture into contemporary world? How are you talking about traditions in today's world? And I, I think we got to see a lot of that. We had a fantastic jury from very diverse backgrounds and diverse countries and languages and cultures, which helps because when you get an entry from a culture which you don't know about personally, but there's somebody else who knows about it, it's always very, very interesting. So two or three of the entries that I would never forget, beautifully, beautifully created illustrations to celebrate the history of Japanese railways. And it was done so beautifully with so much nuance of each of the stations, each of the, uh, the, the focus areas of how people look at the station, how people look at the journeys and uh, what was built around it as an integrated campaign. I think that was really, really beautiful. As a designer, it was heartwarming to see something which was so detailed to such a scale. So there was an entry which, were, which was creating helmets out of sh uh, crushed shells by the sea. And that was really interesting. And it wasn't just the concept. It had come into reality and it's going to be used uh, at the expo in, in two years. Uh, so we are always interested in seeing entries that are real, that are going to make a difference to people in a positive way, uh, without really harming anything that's around us. So I think some of these entries were wonderful. ชุดนกแก้วครับจากบริษัทชุกชีวิตสตูดิโอครับเอ่อตอนปีนี้ปีนี้พิเศษหน่อยให้ให้งานที่มันแตกต่างจากทุกปีอะไรเงี้ยครับเราเราจะเอาคอนเซปต์ของของ AI คิดว่านี่ระยะเริ่มต้นมันทําได้อ่าโปรเซสในการทํางานเนี่ยก็คือเราได้คอนเซ็ปต์มาว่าเราจะสร้างภาพคณะกรรมการทั้งหมดเนี่ยเป็น AI นะครับก็คือเราได้ภาพ
นะครับแล้วก็ในกรรมการแต่ละท่านเนี่ยเราก็จะแอดเรื่องของดีเทลเล็กน้อยเช่นประเทศหรือว่าเชื้อชาติสัญชาติเข้าไปด้วยซึ่งภาพที่ออกมานี่ก็จะเป็นภาพแนวเซมิเรียลลิสติกในธีมของเซมิพังโลกอนาคตครับเออจริงๆเนี่ย AI จะถือ AI เนี่ยมันเข้ามาสักประมาณปีถึงปีกว่าๆนะสปีตอนนี้ก็ถามว่าคุณภาพมันก็ค่อยๆมันมันก็คือมันเป็นเครื่องมือที่สามารถพัฒนาตัวเองได้นะครับแล้วทุกวันเนี่ยด้วยความที่มันเป็น Open Source ออมีนักพัฒนาทั่วโลกเนี่ยช่วยกันพัฒนาเพราะฉะนั้นโตมันเนี่ยก็มีความสามารถเพิ่มขึ้นก็เก่งขึ้นเรื่อยๆเพราะฉะนั้นเข้าถึงคนได้มากขึ้นปีที่แล้วกับปีนี้ถือว่าคนใช้โหดหลายร้อยเปอร์เซ็นที่เพิ่มขึ้นใช่ครับสุดท้ายแล้วเนี่ยเรื่องของ AI เนี่ยผมมองมันเป็นเครื่องมือนะที่เป็นเครื่องมืออย่างหนึ่งที่ที่เอามาช่วยในงานของเราในเรื่องครีเอทีฟเอไอคิดได้ไหมคิดได้นะครับแต่ก็คิดได้ในระดับหนึ่งแบบที่ไอผมเปรียบเทียบ AI เหมือนแพรอดเหมือนนกแก้วกันเราสอนให้นกแก้วพูดนกแก้วพูดได้แต่นกแก้วไม่ได้เข้าใจสิ่งที่สิ่งที่มันพูดนะ AI ปัจจุบันความฉลาดจะประมาณนั้นก็คือว่าเรามี Data ที่เราใส่เข้าไปเรื่องครีเอทีฟโอเคสิ่งที่มันออกมาอาจจะเป็นเราอาจจะหยิบจับมาเป็นไอเดียครีเอทีฟได้แต่สุดท้ายแล้วเนี่ยก็ต้องใช้สกิลครีเอทีฟของมนุษย์ในการ Selection หรือว่าการเลือกอยู่ดีนะครับณตอนนี้ถ้าให้ไอทำร้อยเปอร์เซ็นต์เรื่องครีเอทีฟอะไรเงี้ยคิดว่าน่าจะอีกสักพักถึงจะทําได้ทุกวันนี้ยังต้องอาศัยเรื่องการครีเอทีฟของมนุษย์อยู่ดียูเนมซัมทิงเนอร์เอเวอร์ลูชันารีเกมมิ่งเอสออลเรดี้ดันเอ็ดเฮ้ยไอ้ผมเรติอัมโฟไอ้ผมฟาวน์เดอร์และครีเอเตอร์ของเกมออนเดอะโอนลี่อินดัสทรีพอร์ตัลและคอลัมน์ที่ตอนนี้ที่ทักลส์ที่อินเตอร์เซ็กต์ระหว่างเกมมิ่งและมาร์เก็ตติ้งเราเห็นเอไอตั้งแต่ตอนที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งจริงๆมันเป็นอยู่แล้วนะครับในความเป็นส่วนของการพูดที่เรียกว่าคุณเรียกอะไรที่เป็นการเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่งที่เราเริ่มเกมมิ่ง You know, talk to them in real time, and they can interact with you through the use of AI. So that's interesting for me. So for tomorrow, my session would be about gaming x marketing. It's actually the debut of gaming x marketing as a term in the APAC audience. And what I will do there is to introduce the APAC marketers, especially the creative practitioners, and introducing them to the term, uh, introducing to them to how gaming and marketing. Uh, intersects and how we can come up with the best creative gaming work in this space. Bring it on and game on. My full name is Iraj Faraz Butla. I represent DDB India. Judging is uh, it's a privilege. I was with David, David Guerrero, so it was quite an experience because the way he handles different uh, kinds of opinions. Was uh, intense because being in the jury means that yeah you want to be fair to the work but you want to be objective. You don't want to just award the hard work. You want to award the idea and the impact behind it. And uh, there are disagreements. David handled it beautifully. Genuinely having the voice behind it matters because the discussions are rich. They they are sometimes aggressive. He handled it beautifully and uh, everyone was satisfied. Yeah, well, there's been a lot that's been impressive, um, and not only the work, but the judges and and getting to know people and and the actual process of judging as well uh, has been pretty amazing. It's a pretty hard awards to win um, because it is judged 
with a lot of rigor. But the actual work itself, there's been some great projects from you know solar beehives to this one project that was called Model City that we that really resonated with me because it was both super modern but also quite nostalgic at the same time. So you emotionally connected with it. And the, the great thing about it was they were trying to solve a problem where the pandemic had taken away all of their tourism and they were really struggling from that perspective. And so they needed to create something that's going to bring tourism back. Um, and I think what they did was pretty remarkable. This particular city in Japan made 80% of the, you know, the plastic models that you see in the world, like Tamiya and those sorts of brands. And so what their, their great idea, their, their way of problem solving was to turn the city into a model. So they took, you know, utilitarian type objects like um, post boxes, and they literally created the framework and all the bits of that post box as a sort of piece of art or installation. And, um, but it was still functioning. So you could still post mail into that post box. You know, there's been a real acceleration of needing to problem solve because of the state of things in the world like climate change and you know inequality and all of those sorts of big big issues and i think you know from our perspective as a branding agency creativity and problem solving that we are seen as able to do that in a commercial sense alongside business strategy if you know what i mean so we create creative strategies that connect in with business strategies and because people were seeing branding as a way of actually transformation and transforming businesses, um, yeah, we can, we, can, we can actually work with those businesses to completely change the dynamics of the business. One that really jumped out was um, the Lebanon newspaper, mm -hmm. um, the election edition one. I think that really kind of um, struck a chord, yeah, a chord in me to really see that brands are really now making the leap to not just communicating but actually taking action, so and inspiring actions as well. Yeah, beautifully simple that piece of work as well, and um, incredibly effective. Um, in terms of the way that it kind of communicated. So we were we were feeling quite strongly for that. <laughs> um, one of the other pieces of work that, um, that we really loved was um, Knock Knock as well. Um, again, just just a beautiful idea and um, really important work as well. So, you know, something that's that's got a sort of broader purpose in the world was, was great to see too. Yeah, we were quite, um impacted by that particular campaign which was more than a campaign it was almost like a movement yeah right? um, that really spread across more than like one small target audience but like it really impacted the community i think we're definitely seeing um a, a sort of a step change so i think in the last three years or so people have kind of been hunkered down and they're, they're probably doing safer work um i think we're still starting to see people kind of coming out of that um, the other thing, I mean, and maybe this is just my perspective, but um, I, I'm, I was really excited to see some fun work coming back. So I think for a long time, and, and I know we've talked about two really beautiful, purposeful, um, kind of higher order campaigns, but um, there was also a very fun piece of work from Nissan um, in the show, and it was just joyful, and, and we, we loved that, you know, I think. I think that's important too. So when you talk about risk taking, I think the elections edition is an amazing version of that because it was really, I mean, you're going against government, right? So that's incredibly risky. Um, but then you have the other side of that, which is do something joyful, do th something fun that people really kind of want to um, get excited by. I think it's so important, especially after the COVID years, um, that people find their joy again. Yeah. And, you know, be willing to have, just let loose a little bit and have a little bit of fun. And, you know, the best kind of campaigns is when you can see the brands are actually coming out to have some fun, like, with, you know, with their audiences as well. So I think that's amazing.
I'm Corey Essie. I'm the managing director and executive producer at Finch in Australia and New Zealand. It was really interesting this year. It was introduced by Steve from the APA. You know, we just went through some guide, like guiding principles of production to begin with, and then broke for lunch and everyone got together and just talked about what was happening in their countries and communities. And from there, we went back in and it just triggered a conversation around there were common problems and other countries just have their own problems. But what happens is you get some insights on what is happening around the world and some countries are ahead of other countries and you can see where it's going. There are a lot of challenges facing production, you know, things like internal production companies at agencies taking away work from traditional production companies, uh, that creating a, a world where there's a lot more freelance directors that are leaving production companies to kind of have best of both worlds maybe. There was a uh, discussion around treatments to be paid for uh, as people pitch. There was also, you know, a bit of a celebration, if you like, of some of the working hours changing in some of the countries that have been really challenged over the years and coming out of COVID, they've been able to um, create shorter working hours or more disciplined, rigid um, things to quote against. So that was good. So you end up just seeing a bit of a, a, a trend of what's happening around the world and some countries still really struggling with a lot of elements, you know, with payments and just the way the contracts are happening and others are, are showing ways out of there. So collectively, you end up with really interesting discussion, encouragement, and you get to meet some really interesting people from around the world that are all producers. The first time I've been back at Adverse in four years, uh, we obviously had COVID in between. Uh, like everyone, we entered in not knowing what was going to happen and we slowly saw, saw production creak back in in different forms. Um, it probably changed our business in that we had three offices, you know, across Australia and New Zealand. Um, we did bring a lot more online, you know, which has reduced our you know, need for travel, if you like. Connection was important, so we really focused in on getting the team together every day to check in on everyone. But coming out of that, I think we've just diversified a little bit with the business, you know. Um, we're a film production company at its core. Uh, but we also have other businesses that we're investing in, in the education space, in post-production, in technology, and uh, also in experiential. The industry changes every year, you know, and you obviously follow along with some of those trends. And, you know, we're starting to see the rise of, you know, things like TikTok and the shorter forms of entertainment. But there's also great opportunity, we think, in bringing what we know and our skill set to things like education. And, you know, we've created a, a program called Creatable, which creates education tools for poorer countries to teach kids different ways of uh, using STEM in their, you know, in their environment uh, to better the, you know, their communities and give them opportunity. Uh, we've also got a program that will roll out across Australia and then hopefully across the world, uh, which focuses on showing STEM and creativity as an opportunity for kids at school uh, to move into that world so they don't give up on it. A lot of, um, especially females in Australia, drop out of STEM in around year nine. So it's just encouraging them. And we do that by interviewing different businesses in that STEM space and creating videos that are then used as teaching tools. So we give those tools to the teachers and yeah, goes as flows through to the students. There's some wonderful work this year. We've been seeing, we're in the film craftery, and we've been seeing a lot of really interesting work, really crafted. A lot of works are, are becoming filmic, maybe due to the emerging of the contents in Netflix and Amazon. So uh, aside from the, the usual or the traditional uh, format structure of the, the ads, it's becoming lengthy. Yeah. It's becoming more uh, filmic and uh, better in narrative. Very crafted, lots of attention to detail, some wonderful production, production design, <laughs> lot of directing. Uh, great, yeah. Yeah. That was a piece that really stood out for us. Um, it's a Thai piece um, and it's just directed in the... Actually, it's hilarious. It's so funny. The script is very strong. The talent is very strong. The director just brought everything home. I think it's very crafty in terms of uh, direction. It's very simple, uh, very straightforward. But I guess, you know, what comes you emotionally, uh, that's more important to us. Yeah, absolutely.
During COVID, it was a very scary time for a lot of creative people, right? For clients, for agencies, even in production as directors and whatnot, we we were trying to just, you didn't know what was going to happen, so you couldn't go too crazy. But now that things are getting better, thankfully, everyone's really going out there and just putting their best foot forward and just going for the ideas that they've had and just pushing for it. So this is great for us because it just means more craft, more work, more good stuff. Uh, and just better things to look at, and it just elevates the overall level of the industry, which is exactly what we want to aspire to. Yeah. After watching all of the entries, you can feel the passion, yeah. you know, of all the of, uh, film directors out there, the creative people in their jobs, in their work. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Borderless creativity is something that Ogilvy really believes in. It's really at the foundation of all the work we do, and we believe it is what allows us to create work that has real impact. And what it actually is, because, you know, it's a big concept, is about removing the borders between things. So removing the borders within our own network, for example. So we, we often cross-pollinate ideas, collaborate with other agencies in our global network and we find that that's a really rich way to work. And we also um, define borderless creativity as removing the borders between things, so between technologies, you know, rather than separating into different disciplines, we remove the borders between them so that it creates this free flow of ideas and it's where really interesting work happens when things intersect. So technology intersecting with media, intersecting with film, intersecting with digital, you know, just as many interesting intersections that can happen as possible, that's where the true impact lies. I think we had 15 teams uh, participating in the Young Lotus competition this year, and they all brought you know, uh, an immense amount of um, energy and excitement uh, and creativity in all their work. Everyone was really, worked really good at presenting their work too, which was great, and hopefully that's something they learned over the few days of workshops that we had with them. Um, in most part, I think everyone really stuck to the brief pretty well, right? I think the brief was very tight uh, and single-minded, so everyone came with that in mind and didn't go off brief so much. I think um, some would, you know, we had some tight discussions in the in the judging room afterwards to go through all the ideas and pick the four finalists that were most on brief in terms of getting attention and goals of, uh, from our client. I'd say in terms of trends, there was not really a common sort of trend in terms of you know, ideas or execution, but two things uh, they had uh, in common was, one, the nature of the brief was actually centered around pop culture, so something that, you know, it's universal in common. But secondly was, there was a core insight in every of the ideas that they presented, and that's coming back to, you know, like, being human and being relevant to, you know, um, I mean, they were all from different markets, so they came in from a point of view from their local nuances and, you know, a culture and insights. So, and, you know, the platform that the briefs was, uh, you know, talking about is something that is very human. Um, heat happens, which, you know, pretty much is a very human, uh, you know, uh, centered uh, platform. So that was the main common thing that we had. We selected the DACA team unanimously um, because obviously their, their idea was, you know, impactful, entertaining. Um, everyone was, you know, reaching for the stars, going big because we told them to go big. There's no money involved from with these projects or these uh, competitions, so they can think as big as they want. And they had a really uh, fascinating way of bringing their idea to life, um, around centering around pop culture, uh, true to the brand, it was really refreshing. It, there was a lot of great ideas, but that one just stood out because it was like square on in every aspect, uh, and that's why we loved it. The idea was, um, it was centered around pop culture and the two, um, you know, the people in the execution could be interchanged. So whether it was running into you know, the region like Asia or whether it's you know, somewhere else in the world, um, that's very interchangeable. So the idea was uh, universal enough. Um, I mean, that was part of the strength of the ideas in terms of cultural uh, insights, probably some other, you know, ideas from the other teams, uh, you know, had that even more. Um, but that wasn't, you know, the main uh, criteria to be picking. No, the brief was to come up with a global idea.
sort of a lot of uh, really imaginative, inventive, progressive work, uh, particularly in, in, in branded entertainment and branded content, uh, ideas that truly wove themselves into popular culture in an interesting way. The craft always is of the highest order because I expect immaculate craft, but this year there were a few pieces that were, I mean, beautifully done and beautifully observed and, and captured the sort of rich flavor of the, of the region. Any form of content competes with popular culture and people, I've always believed that we don't have a divine right to people's attention. We intrude in people's lives and we have to re reward them for the time they spend with any form of communication. Branding content really, first and foremost, has to be engaging and incredibly interesting. Um, entertainment, of course, is the operative word. Do you entertain, do you engage um, in, in, in a form of communication that people, people want to consume and people want to share? Obviously, the, the pressure that the, we as an industry are facing at this moment in time is, is, is huge. You know, we're obviously on one end of the spectrum. We have clients taking their business in-house. We have the consultancies on the other end of the spectrum. Um, we have the platforms you know, surrounding us. But at the heartbeat of communication today, I believe that the creative communication companies really do have a place at the table and do have an important place at the table because they are ideas, they are an ideas industry, and ideas are valuable, and ideas will always be valuable to business today. As long as we invest in that, and, and we use that in a powerful fashion to create that connective tissue with people, uh, we will be successful. And what's interesting, you know, when you, you talk about clients, there's a, there's a new breed of client today um, who've grown up in, you know, in, a, in a different way and are totally versed in technology, they understand the importance of human data and intelligence. They're looking to use technology in new ways to connect to people. They're looking to infuse data into their communication. Um, but they're also brave, audacious, because they know they have to be to, to connect to society who have zero interest in advertising. And I think clients who have their finger on the pulse of society, on the pulse of culture, are the most successful. At FS it's a two plus two festival. The first two days is more on production, craft, and technology. Uh, the second last day is the DNA of FS, which is all about creativity. We even implement this diversity over the lunch that we provide for our delegates. Out of the four-day lunch, one day will be destined to Asian noodles. In our region, every market has a different way of preparing noodles and eating noodles. From India to Southeast Asia to Korea, each market has quite a different way of uh, taste. We want to extend into our event itself, you know, certain unique characteristic of a country. So we're beginning to, to try to make Advest not only just an event of speakers, but also in itself represent the different cultures in the region that is reflected here. The, the primary reason for the growth for India is that the, the huge desire in the consumer in India, in the people in India, to make it big. That's why you're seeing a lot of people, startups, doing startups, new businesses. Government schemes are targeted as giving loans to people, making them start their own business very fast. You're seeing younger generation being very motivated to do well on their own. And I think also their attitude towards jobs. India was a market where jobs meant government jobs. Employment meant uh, the government will give you the employment. That's what people felt. But that's changing. People today are starting their own business and they understand the meaning, the true meaning of employment. Self-employment also means employment today, which is not completely changed, but it is gradually changing. The attitude is changing. So I can see the growth is coming primarily from the desire in people and, and desire to grow.
So Coca-Cola over the years has been an icon of cultural leadership around the world, right? It's been the beacon of optimism and positivity, always seeking to bridge prejudices, to bridge divides, and to make the world a better place, right? From the Coke Hilltop song in 1971, when they taught the world to sing together, to Mean Joe Green, where they had a point of view on racism, and to several other campaigns over the world. Coke has actually had a point, active point of view on problems afflicting our world. And in the Middle East, <laughs> which is a pretty, you know, uh, affected region by a lot of anxieties, be it political, social, cultural. And that gives Coca-Cola a very interesting opportunity to stamp its cultural leadership credentials upon the region and upon the world. Uh, so we've done a lot of work for Coca-Cola, which has been very effective, uh, both in terms of impacting people, impacting business and impacting culture. The best piece of work that I can think of is the Remove Labels campaign, where we actually removed the labels of Coca-Cola's cans, and we got people to see each other uh, in a new light without any prejudice. How do we feel? I guess I feel the same every year. Uh, trepidation. Although we think we are well prepared, you never know what's going to happen. And it's the same feeling every year. I suppose like everybody, you know, when you go into an examination, you, you, you feel very uncomfortable, even though you think you're well prepared. Having said that, I can say that after 20 years, I feel fairly confident of what we are to expect. In a way, this year, we try to give a new image to AdFast. We have uh, 30, two speaker sessions. We have the breakout stage, which is new. We have the open space workshop, which is new. And we basically uh, delete the old four plan and use the space to its maximum. And so anyone who has been to AdFast before, he or she will feel this is not the same AdFast that they've been to. Because in a way, we are, we, we are diluting our our delegate. In the old days, they were all being hurdled into the main event hall. This year, they have the choice. There are many choices uh, to, to go around. Our industry needs something to set benchmark every year, to send a signal every year. What is the best creativity? I mean, imagine what it's like uh, for the movie industry if there's no Oscar. For our festival, award is only part of the component. 
uh, it is a platform for people across the region, the Asia Pacific and MENA region, to come over to exchange ideas and to see what were the best creativity in the past year. Here in Netfest, we call, we named uh, three products. It's like the jewel of the crown. Every year, we invite um, agency network to run the Young Lotus, where young team, creative team, 28 years or below, um, come from this year, 15 city. And for the first time, we have a Young Lotus team from Cairo. Uh, to go through one and a half day workshop, learning from the instructor uh, from the ADK network, that's this year. And think about it, these people in eight, 10 years time, they'll be the management of various uh, agency across the region. So that's one product we, we are very proud of and we believe uh, this is our contribution back to the, to the industry. Another item, another product is called the Fabulous Four. Uh, this is um, open for new director uh, to create, to produce a short film based on the theme of FS of this year. And the earlier Fabulous Four, those young director, has now become very hot film director, commercial film director, even in Europe. So in a way, we, uh, we help nourishing uh, our production partner uh, to help bring new blood into the market. The third product is that um, this, we call it the Lotus Root, which is unique to FS. In this category, we recognize the best creativity using local culture. The Asia Pacific region plus the MENA region is a very diversified and very cultural rich region. And you can see uh, creativity, making the most out of the local culture. And that's really is something that we would like to encourage and recognize. We are in the business of selling idea. Okay. Uh, even if you create a good idea, a great idea, if you cannot sell it, it's not complete. The Innova Lotus, we talk about innovation. We're talking about um, what's gonna happen in the very near future. And this is a very important uh, uh, category. And when you see the creator or the agency who could create the campaign come over to present the idea to the super panel, which consists of all the eight jury president, I believe it's going to be a very rewarding session. I think Can tries to do it, but I think that uh, one of the most interesting things about AdFest is the fact that every jurist is from a different country, um, both on on all on the early things I judge, like branded content, and then on uh, Innova and Lotus. Everyone was from a different country, brought a different perspective and culture. What was really interesting was that on the very best work, um, it was unanimous a lot of times, even though we were all from completely different backgrounds. But it's a great show. It's intimate and kind of warm and uh, yeah, I think it's not like any other show I've ever been to. You know, I, I think I saw a few ideas that I didn't think that people properly explained the problem that they were trying to solve. So there was just this creative piece of work 
which had no context or why did you do it? Why did you go to all this effort? What was the real issue underlying the work? And we saw that a few times. And it really, the work never flies with the jury when you don't explain the, uh, the client issue. I've been working on MasterCard's Priceless Campaign for 20 years and uh, one of the things we've tried to do is make sure, one way we've worked to keep it fresh is to make sure it's culturally resonant so we don't have so many guidelines that people can't, that, that agencies can't express the campaign best for their culture. The other thing we're doing is we're launching sort of a, an evolution of the campaign called Start Something Priceless which is really about MasterCard and people trying to make a positive impact every day on the world, on an impact that's beyond money, that's priceless. So we were chatting a little bit earlier about Lotus Roots. Yes. Can you, uh, can you talk, tell me why that interested you so much? What I love about the idea of Lotus Roots is that there is a swagger and a uh, I mean, a call that we can give to individual cultures. It will become popular again to do work that is just designed for your culture rather than doing a version of what would be sell internationally. Exactly. And I just, I think that's, that's the most powerful part of this because A, it'll get better work, more effective work in individual cultures. B, we'll see some incredible stuff coming out of, and we're already seeing it coming out of Egypt and Thailand this year. It was like my favourite, favourite spots came out of Thailand and there just completely Thai. I mean, I, I, I want to go work in Thailand. I don't want to go do the US thing. And I think that's the power of having, a, um, putting a fire in the belly of people for their own culture and who they are as individuals. Yeah, it's in Thailand, you know, transform for like uh, the last 10 years is uh, different, you know. Uh, the last 10, year, 10, 10 years ago, I worked in the above the line, mixed to like a direct marketing, mixed into like an inter interactive uh, ANC, right? Um, over like a 10 years past, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, direct marketing feel that business is not, is not going well. Mm -hmm. So it's transformed into like a digital, changed into email marketing, changed into interactive, you know? So it's the same time, you know, it's gradually changed and it's become smaller and smaller. And right now it's like a totally like a uh, digital business, it become booming, right? That's why, you know, um, most of the above the line NC become smaller and smaller and digital NC become bigger, bigger and bigger. And in some uh, department like direct marketing department inside international advertising NC become very small because of uh, we don't have any business anymore, that's why. At that time, you know, um, client, our, our client AP Thailand, you know, they want uh, us to create a brand, um, a brand awareness for like a, for, 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 for the brand of AP. So we decide to do something else, you know. We, we don't want to do like um, the regular advertising to do the awareness, right? So we look into the brief again that, you know, client want to communicate uh, the space. They, they are very good on in space, space design. So we decided, oh, why not we do the designing space for them, the unusual space, and tell our theory that, you know, we are good at the space management. So we decided, you know, why not we do like a football field, football pitch in the early Gula shape. So this shape can fit into any type, any, any form of shape, any, any space that, you know, a consumer have or, you know, people have. And change the unusual shape into the football field. So that at that time, we think that this might be a good idea. So we propose this idea to Kayan. Uh, Kayan then already accept it, and after that, we build it. Yes. Well, I like to look at it this way. You know, the industry itself goes on every day without stop. New things come in, old things go out. 
But I think occasionally you need a kind of a, a time out period, a time to take stock and look back on what has been done over the year, you know. In, in a way, it's like going on a holiday. You, you, you go away from it all and then take stock of yourself, you know. Ask yourself, what, what you have been doing? Has they been relevant? What, has, what was new? What are your future plans, etc.? So I think the industry needs this to, to look back on itself so that it can refocus and look forward in a way. That's how I see it. Yes. As I've just said, there's a huge talent deficit in our business and it's growing. And at the same time, this huge pool of untapped creative talent waiting to be harnessed. And for the most part, we're not really doing anything about it. It's bad for our clients' businesses and they're beginning to realize that. The ad business is actually surprisingly conservative for a supposedly creative, open-minded, outward-looking industry. We're not as accommodating of difference as you might think. And the factors I've outlined here compound that conservatism. Actually, we usually don't change until we're asked to. Well, we are being asked to, and it is possible to do something about it. So 23% uh, uh, of women end up uh, in senior roles. Uh, and in the UK, again, credit departments are, are only 29% female. Uh, in the UK, although the intake into advertising in all disciplines is more or less evenly split, it drops to 30% of women in leadership positions. In London, only 12% of credit directors are female, and only 8% of agency leaders are female. The, these are not good figures. They're, we've kind of got used to them, but we need to be embarrassed by them. This is a, a quote from Sheila Kolhatka, writing in The New Yorker. It's the imbalance of power and pay that puts men in a position to house. That gives them unchecked power of the economic lives of women, and therefore, their physical lives. should ask me about two years into address, 18 years ago. That was terrible. We didn't really know what we were doing exactly, but somehow we blundered through. Huh? And uh, after the fifth year, I guess we knew that it was okay for me anyway. I mean, I've been saying to, to, the, to the people attending FS, I said, a couple of years back, maybe it's eight years, 10 years back when I'm, you know, running the festival during this week, I walking around look like an angry bird, right? Because there's many issues, you know, to, to uh, manage. But in the last couple of years, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed because the, the team is very well, you know, experienced and the way to run it. And we get people the jury, the delegate, everyone, the speakers saying that, wow, FS is really well run, very organized, very professional. And of course, with the famous hospitality of Thai, like, you know, Thai people. So I think we, we, we came a long way, but um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. proud, I'm happy with the, the festival, you know, after 20 years. Yeah, well, people keep saying that to me too. And uh, one of the things I would like to do is to go to other festivals and actually to see what we are doing right. Because I guess we think we are doing right. And people are saying, you yeah, know, this is a wonderful thing. So I want to see what it is that the other people are not doing that make us so well received. <laughs> That's such a puzzle to me. Yes. Well, I can I can uh, say something about it because I, I do attend many other festivals. Oh, well, you, you would... uh, I think you know um, our co coordination, our liaison team is very strong. 
uh, we do not left out, leave out any people or any speaker, any 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 you know juries uh, unattained. Mm -hmm. And our team always put a very very smiling face and do extra step to ensure you know thing is done or the requests from the speaker and the juries uh, made. Well, that's 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 going too far, you know. I like to think probably five years ahead. Uh, you can see a big shift in the media scene. Né? Life used to be just television and, and, and print ad, you know, poster, things like that. And nowadays we're talking about 18 categories. And a lot of them, to me, and an and old-timer, is really bits and pieces of media rather than television per se. So I foresee a kind of shift from the, the big, the main frame thing to lots of little uh, niche medium. And I personally, I don't see, I can't see much beyond five years how much that is going to affect the total media scene, if you like. Well, if you look at the festival around the world, everyone is trying to echo what the landscape a changing landscape of the industry. Mm. That's why uh, some move to very technical, some move to other area. As far as FS concerned, uh, we will still try to maintain the core of uh, the core spirit of uh, the festival, which is creativity. Yeah. Having said that, we do need to echo, you know, the the, the changing landscape of the uh, industry. But one thing um, we are pretty sure of is regarding in the next five, 10 years, how festival change or how the awards uh, 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 set up change. FS is always a platform for people to come here to and network, learn something. to learn something, to exchange ideas. That is, yeah. I mean, you look at the theme of FS this year, diversification, right? No other festival in this region has such a diversified uh, delegate, speaker, and jury. And everybody come here inevitably would network and exchange idea. I think that is the core spirit of FS, you know, beyond, uh, you know, the next five, 10 years. Oh, yes, I, I guess in that sense, uh, however you are saying that, however the media changed uh, the core concept of coming here and learning something on creativity, would be our sort of raison d'etre. This is something we we fixed on. I would add that something else we're very keen on, and that is about the, 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 the local culture in the region, because advertising is something important. Now it's not invented here. And there's a danger of us copying things, Western thing, thinking that is a better way. And in fact, it's not at all. And I think we have succeeded to 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 be the rally flag of this. Now, we we even have a, a an award called Lotus Roots, which is really to to call people back and say, look, it's here. You know, don't don't look elsewhere. This is us. This is ours. Let's keep it. I think we I think we've done this also. One final point I like to add is that um, we have made tremendous efforts in uh, helping young practitioner. Yes. And with, with like Young Lotus, Fabulous Four, and we have a young delegate fee, we have student fee. And you can see the average age of the delegate attending FS is younger than the other festival. We, uh, mm -hmm. We're so happy that young people come here, you know, bright eye, bushy tails, and they will be the future leader of our industry. Indeed, yes. What? I'm glad you mentioned that. People have said that to me too, that there's a certain vibrancy, certain youthfulness about affairs that, uh, that is, is, is so a unique point of, of, of the event. Yeah, so I agree with you on that. Okay. This. All right. Thank you. That's it, is it? Ah, my porridge is not getting cold. Yes. It is. Oh.
Don't. Welcome to AdFest 2017. We're standing here in Braindrool, presented by Hakuhodo Products. I have with me today, Corey Essi, jury president of Filmcraft and new director Lotus. Corey, would you please tell us a little bit about your experience judging your category this year? Yeah, well, uh, our category was split into two sections. There was the new director um, category, which uh, is just for directors that have and they got two years experience or less than seven films. Um, there wasn't a lot of entries this year in that category. And I think moving forward, it would be beneficial, you know, production companies to really think about what work they could enter into that category, because uh, I think there's great opportunity to showcase your young director's work uh, to, you know, this entire region. Uh, there'll be some work played on um, Friday night, which uh, I, I think the exposure for, for those guys is going to be great. Um, and uh, then the other side of the jury, obviously, was the uh, film craft, um, where seven of us came together. We're all from different countries from around the world. And I think AdFest is a very special show in that um, the regional work and the flavor of the regional work really comes into play. And I think you rely on your jury members to um, have good conversation and talk about why something's relevant in their market. And you know, you've got to listen and take on um, uh, all those elements of you know the cultural sensitivities and the reasons why a certain thing is what it is and it, you look at the work differently so you end up having really good robust conversations around uh why a piece of work is good and relevant but i think at the end of the day uh, you end up finding that you get to a common place and unanimous, unanimously vote, voting on you know something uh in most categories you know the, the great work stands out excellent thank you um and so did you see any techniques or ideas being used that were new to yeah. engage the audience? Uh, look, I think there was not like one kind of style or trend or something that popped out this year, but what I did notice was this year, uh, there was a lot more longer films. So it, the trend I would say is probably longer films being entered into craft. Um, it felt like the ratio was probably a third of the work was TVCs and two thirds of the work was um, content and long form this year. Uh, so, it changes the dynamics of how you judge craft because it becomes an incredibly long um, judging process, I suppose. And uh, what I would say is I think uh, sometimes the shorter work benefits in that there's probably more um, focus and craft and the money doesn't have to go as far. In the longer pieces of work, I just noticed that um, it, it, you kind of, it, it, the dollars should expand, you know, to go out. And you know that in the industry, often it's just matched with the same as what a TVC might have. So I think it becomes more difficult sometimes to get out longer. And I think you open yourself up to more criticism as well for that piece of work as it goes on longer. So um, I think we had a combination though of work that was that's meddled uh, for both TVCs and the long form. Okay. So Thank you. Um, and so I also want to ask you about in 2016, Best Ads TV category Finch was named the number one production company in the world. Uh, what was the drive and idea behind your production company's success? Uh, I, look, I think we had a great year last year and that we had certain directors um, kind of reaching their peak of, um, I think it takes time for a director to get to a certain level. And as they do, uh, they kind of hit a sweet spot. And we had a few guys last year that were really at the top of their game and we got hold of some really good scripts and had some great partnerships with the agencies. and. You know, we've got a little bit of diversification at the office with, you know, we do some tech projects as well as film and some entertainment. So I think that complete body of work probably helped us, you know, get a few extra points that some of the others, the other people, you know, didn't get to have a go at. So. Well, well done. Yeah. Very well done. Thank you. Um, I have one more question for you. Uh, yeah. If you can give any advice yep. to upcoming entries uh, being placed in film craft or yep. director Lotus, what would you yeah. say? Oh, look, I think for production companies, um, do enter your uh, new directors because, you know, uh, there's a production company of the year award and obviously everyone wants to win that. And, you know, I think there's great opportunities for people to really bolster their status, you know, in the region by having work that comes through that category as well as in the craft categories, you know. So cheers. Awesome. Yeah. Well, cool. no worries. I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. No worries. Great cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Excellent. Thank you. No worries.